In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk about supplements, but more specifically, we talk about the five most overrated supplements. These are supplements that you see on the market right now. Heavy, heavy marketing. Lots of people talking about using them and all their benefits, but we dive into the science. We talk about our experience, our personal experience, our experience with our clients, and we explain why we think the following five supplements are totally overrated. We start out by talking about branched chain amino acids. Then we get into fat burners. Then we talk about nitric oxide boosters. Then we move to testosterone boosters. And finally, we talk about collagen protein. Again, listen to this episode and hear why we think those products are totally overrated. Also, this month, MAPS Split is 50% off. Now, MAPS Split is a hardcore bodybuilding, physique competitor, bikini competitor type workout program. It's six days a week in the gym. So you need to be relatively advanced to follow it. But boy, the results you get from following it are incredible. We've already gotten some before and afters from people who follow the program and they're nothing short of spectacular. Anyway, it's 50% off, right? So here's how you get the discount. Go to mapssplit.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-P-L-I-T.com and use the code SPLIT50. That's S-P-L-I-T-5-0, no space, for the discount. A while ago, we were talking about like trying to... I mean, and we have to write these down. Doug, you've got to start making a little list when we when, the, when these conversations happen of all the failed ideas or things that... Yes. You remember? Do you remember, you guys, we shot... I think we did at least five of these YouTube videos where we did the green screen and we would talk about somebody exercising. Oh, oh Remember yeah, that? And yeah, we never oh. aired them because we, we sounded like we were just picking we were on... just Like bullying dicks. people. Yeah, so we're like, uh... We were this close, though, <laughs> it to... It would have gone like... Crazy though. We're, I think so too. I think I bet it would go. Loved it. I bet if we watched it now, that'd be amazing. Oh, we get so much hate though. That's, I don't think so. No, no, we would get so much hate. I, I was, was so scared of that. Though. I was talking in an interview I just did. <laughs> Weak. Weak. And they asked me like one of the challenges. Be a bully. That we have now today with the business, and I go one of the one of the greatest challenges that we all have to think about now that I think is really different than how Mind Pump started is we uh, we have to like really like we, we used to like no holds bar say whatever talk yeah. shit to whoever because we were the little guy and everybody's rooting for the little guy to beat up the, yeah. the yeah. big bully we don't look like a bully yeah right because yeah. you're yeah you're punching up yeah so so it was back then we were so small it was like we could call people out we actually titled episodes mind yeah. pump versus versus certain people your name because we didn't you know because they, they gave out bad information but anyway that reminds me we should talk about the five most underrated, overrated supplement. <laughs> <laughs> since we're on a yeah, it's a little throwback. Since, since we're on that on that that screen. well, well, I think that we owe it to our audience, considering that mm -hmm. uh, we did the five probably most valuable supplements, and we went into that, and that was uh, that yeah, episode. We gotta balance it out. That episode went viral, and the, we've getting a, a lot of response uh, from that. And I think okay, if we're gonna list the, the top five. Uh, we should come up with a list of what we think are the bottom five supplements. Now, yeah. now to be clear, these aren't the worst supplements. They're the most overrated, yeah. overhyped. Yeah, because there's stuff, there's stuff out there that's a complete, does nothing. Yeah. There's no use for them whatsoever. But they don't get a lot of hype. Yeah. They don't have a lot of advertising around them. Yeah, we wanted. We tried to, to think of some popular ones that a lot of people think are going to do a whole lot for them. No, that's exactly what we did. Well, the first thing we did was we went and we we searched the top. 25 supplements sold and then we we pulled the five out of that so we didn't want to waste our time with uh some bullshit that somebody's you know snake oil somebody's yeah. hustling that's got a small percentage of the market i want to yeah. we want to address uh the big sellers that a lot of people are buying into because of the great marketing behind them and how overrated are they really with their their overall results whatever it is right sort of now, now to be clear um if you look at marketing if you just look at pure marketing for the most part most supplements are overrated and what i mean by that is if you look at marketing companies will have, and this is by the way this isn't just with supplements this is with any product you buy it's typically overrated when you just look at the marketing because they'll have you think that taking the supplement will solve your fitness problems, taking a supplement will burn body fat, build muscle. But the reality is, and we, we preach this time and time again on the podcast, that diet, exercise, and lifestyle make up 98% of pretty much anything you're going to get. The other 2% can come from effective supplements, and, and really only if you need these supplements. Um, and then there's the overrated ones. These are supplements that are – lots of people take them. They're on lots of different products, and they just don't do a whole lot. They don't do a whole lot at all. Well, and the, the first one that comes to mind for me is uh, 
BCAAs, branch chain amino acids, and this is a this is a tough one. We have you know we have plenty of friends that uh, have that sell and market mm -hmm. branch chain amino acids. Can I can I sell BCAAs and make a case for them? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. I can per, can tell people that there is a place, there is a consumer where it may make sense to the endurance athlete, uh, the person who's training extremely hard and is doing double day workouts every day. And I can, and also having a hard time hitting their protein intake. So That's the, the key right yeah. there. So the branch amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. They're essential amino acids, meaning you have to consume them because your body can't make them. Now they're found in high amounts in pretty much every complete protein source. So if you eat a piece of beef or steak, there's going to be all the amino acids that you need, including the branch amino acids. If you have milk, if you have, you know, a vegan protein of some sort, you know, tofu, for example, or soy, you're going to have branched amino acids in there. They are found in all complete protein sources. Um, now, you know, this is not, by the way, branched amino acids isn't a new supplement. They've been around for a very long time and they tend to go through this cycle of popular and then not too popular. Mm. The first time I heard about them was in the in the 90s when I first started working out and lifting weights. Yeah, I took them as a kid. And they would use studies that were done on uh, burn victims and people in, in hospitals. And what they found was in these studies that when they gave burn victims branched amino acids, they healed faster. And so they took that and said, this is a great recovery yeah. supplement. Or Weren't they those the two examples, it was like burn victims and bodybuilders, like, and they would always like make an exception for higher amounts of protein uh, for those types of situations. Well, what they would do is they would, in these studies, they were using them on people that were consuming very low amounts of protein. And because branched amino acids are essential, um, meaning they're very important, if your overall protein is low, supplementing with branched amino acids probably will yield you some benefits. In my experience, the only clients I've ever seen benefit from branched amino acids were my vegan clients whose protein intakes were very, very low. You know, I'm talking about clients who would consume, you know, 40 or 50 grams of protein a day and I'd have them take branched amino acid tablets before and after the workouts and they would notice a benefit. Other than that, yeah. uh, and by the way, this, this isn't just our opinion. This is branched amino acids have been studied time and time again on athletes for building muscle recovery. And every single time when the athletes eat sufficient protein, the branched amino acids, complete waste of money. Okay, so now how are they selling it today in terms of like like your average person, gym goer? Like, Because I see a lot of these influencers are getting into the BCA thing where they're drinking it constantly like throughout the day saying that they're going to get gains that way. Well, the theory and the idea in the bodybuilding community and why all of them do it there is uh, and where it you when you listen or you read the studies like like Sal's referring to, some people will interpret that like, okay, well, I'm in a, a caloric restrict diet. I'm cutting for a show for six to ten weeks. Mm. And so my body's catabolic. And so I'm gonna take the 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 BCAAs for, for muscle, muscle preservation. For, yes, for mm. muscle sparing reasons, I'm gonna take the BCAAs in hopes that my body will burn that before it burns body fat or burns muscle. But what what they're not realizing is that and this goes for all competitors, most all competitors are not only eating adequate protein, they're eating uh, 1.5, yeah, an excess amount of protein. I've never trained a, a competitor that uh, didn't know the importance of protein and didn't consistently get their targets in every single day, even in a cut. Uh, that That's the they, that's the magical the mar right. macronutrient. So if they're already hitting the, their targets for the magical mar uh, macronutrient, even if they're in a cut and they're taking, it's a waste of money. Total. And now the, the question arises, okay, if my protein intake is low, do I benefit more from taking branched amino acids or do I benefit more from eating more protein? You benefit more from eating more protein. Branched amino acids are a terrible replacement for protein as well. Now you'll benefit, you'll get some benefits because you have low protein and your body could use some more branched amino acids, but you're still better off just having more protein in your diet. Now, what they one of the other ways that they sell it is they say, okay, branched amino acids. We know that they're important for building muscle. Um, so why don't you just drink them all day long? Why don't you drink them all day long so you have this constant flow of these important amino acids in your blood, and your muscles will always build and they won't shrink. This is also totally false. You don't need to have a constant intake of protein or amino acids in order to preserve muscle or build muscle. 
the best studies we have show that maybe eating every four to six hours will maximize the, the, the rate of muscle growth. Anything more than that doesn't really do anything for you. And I want to say this, too many branched amino acids can actually cause uh, competition for certain key neurotransmitters in the brain. High doses of branched amino acids might even cause some people to feel down or depressed or kind of tired. Not to mention that, wouldn't you theorize too that you eventually would get desynthesized, desynthesized, Sen sensitized. Thank you. Got, <laughs> they just saved me there. You yeah. fucked me up too. <laughs> <laughs> eventually, because you are eating so much protein, taking so much BCAs. I mean, one of the things that, um, and I think I know Ben Pakolsky talks about it now. What other bodybuilder friends do I know that that actually promote a fast or a protein fast at least once a week or throughout their diet? And one of the things that I, I experimented with when I was competing was doing these fasting days with athletes and, or competitors and myself. And I always noticed that when I actually reduced protein significantly for a day or fasted completely, when I reintroduced it, I felt like my body responded more to it. So my concern would be, or what I'd theorize, is that these these competitors that are not only hitting their max protein intake all the time and then also taking BCAs, like they're getting like little to no benefit. In fact, they'd probably get a ton of benefit by completely reducing or eliminating for a day and then reintroducing. Yeah, too too much all the time, all the time. Probably not. Um, not the body would adapt. Yeah, probably Just, not. Why super, wouldn't it adapt like everything else? They actually have studies on that. They show that when people reduce protein and bump it back up, that their protein synthesis rates uh, tend to spike. I noticed that feeling um, as well. The other thing is, uh, is this, is that because, and this is what marketers have done now with branched amino acids, and it's brilliant. One thing I like observing about the supplement space is how brilliant they're able to market uh, certain things. So what they've done is they've established that branched chain amino acids are a supplement for building muscle and for performance. So that's been established because we've been advertised branched amino acids for a long time. So we know that. Then brilliant supplement companies realized, hey, what if we made a really tasty drink and then all we have to do is sprinkle branched amino acids in this, and now we can call this a muscle building drink. Mm -hmm. Because tasty drinks have been around for a long time. You know, calorie free, tasty drinks have been around for a while. We have, you know, diet, you know, with diet sodas, we have, you know, crystal light and all that stuff. How do I make crystal light a bodybuilding and muscle building supplement? I know. Let's sprinkle branched amino acids in. So what a lot of people do is they buy these drinks, they love the taste of them. And then they think, oh, because it has yeah. leucine, isoleucine, and valine, this makes it a muscle this building This is the same supplement. thing you've done with protein bars. There's, it's really, you look at the macros and it looks the same as a candy bar. Yeah, it just has more protein. There's more protein. Is <laughs> add protein, now it's healthy. Now, that's, it. that's so true, Sal, because the, the, there's a lot of bodybuilders that uh, listen to the show, and I still catch them doing that, and that's their justification. They like the taste. Yeah. yeah. I like the taste, and I'm, I'd rather be drinking that than drinking a soda or something. You, yeah. You're not only getting no additional benefit, uh, you're probably spending more money. You're better expensive off, water. Yeah, you're better off with just drinking Crystal Light. And then, like I said, like I, exactly, or and like I said before, pay attention because you could be consuming so many branched amino acids that you're actually causing yourself to feel a little down because of the way that they can affect uh, neurotransmitter production. You have to have a lot of them to do that, but that's still a possibility. Uh, but again, studies are conclusive. If your protein intake is relatively high, branched chain amino acid supplements are a complete and utter waste of money. They do nothing. And, it for, and, for, anyway. and relatively high, you need to be clear. Is not it doesn't mean like high, like I, I take no, about in, 0.6 to yes. grams to one gram of, of protein. What we recommend, it. right, right, right. And and that's where you'll get maximum benefits from you know from from protein. Uh, the next category is actually probably the biggest, most popular, highest selling category oh. of supplements. And should have been number one. Probably. It promises everything in a pill. Yes. I mean, for the most part of what everybody's coming into the gym for. And what is that? Fat loss. That's it. Fat burners. You know, the the and this fat burners have always been a bit of a, a, a top seller in the supplement space because of what they promise to do and because that's what everybody wants to do is, mm -hmm. is lose weight. But in the 90s um, and early 2000s, you had fat burners that started including ephedra in their formulation. And they became blockbusters. Things like Xenadrin. Remember oh, Xenadrin? Xenadrin was huge. I know Hydroxycut sold something like $160 million a year on its own. This is when fat burners 
really went main mainstream. Before that, there was a, a, a fat burner. It was an appetite suppressant. It was sold to housewives. I think they called it Dexedrine. Do you guys remember that? Mm-hmm. Dexedrine on TV or whatever. And it was a very similar formulation to what you see in fat burners now. It, it, was, a, it was a strong stimulant. But you know when the fat burners included ephedra, they exploded because you feel a fat burner when you take it. This is what, this is what makes it hard to convince people that fat burners are largely a waste of money is that you definitely feel them. Yeah. You take it and it's like, oh, I'm on something. This is definitely working. Well, because it affects your central nervous system. That's why. They're, they're, they're packed full of very strong stimulants. And studies show with some fat burners when they do six or 12 week you know, periods that sometimes people do lose more weight that's on them. But you need to understand what's happening with the fat burner that causes it. The fat burner itself isn't burning more body fat. It isn't a magic fat burning compound. It's typically because it, it's a stimulant that causes you to not want to eat as much. Yeah. So it's an appetite suppressant. Think about like twitching all day. Well, yeah, I would say <laughs> that and move more. It's, yeah. the, it's If people see results from it, it's the combination of the two of those. It's you with lots more energy and it's you having an appetite that's suppressed. Right. Those two things. Now, a lot of people will think, well, then cool. Then, okay, fine. I don't care how it works. I know it works. Let me try that. Here's the problem. There is a rebound effect yeah. when you go off of fat burners. Like all stimulants, um, caffeine being a stimulant, right? So when you drink coffee or you have an energy drink, you notice that you'll get a certain feeling from it. Drink that same drink every single day and you mm-hmm. notice a very rapid tolerance buildup. What, what one cup of coffee did today, I need to have one and a half or two cups tomorrow to give me right. the same effect. It just keeps increasing constantly. And, and over time, a short period of time with stimulants, you build up a tolerance very quickly. Over a very short period of time, you, uh, you you don't feel anything except for side effects. And you see this with people who chronically drink lots and lots of coffee. Over time, they just get the anxiety and the, they, they lose sleep over it, but they don't feel good anymore. This is because the body starts to adapt. So fat burners do this. So initially, I have energy, appetite goes away, I build a tolerance. Now I'm taking them just to feel normal. Now I'm starting to feel a little shitty. Now I got to go off. Here's what you're left with. You're left with a body that adapted to strong stimulants that now is not getting those stimulants. So now you have a month of feeling like crap and a high appetite. And so this is what you see with people who lose weight with fat burners is they lose weight, gain it way, way back up. Um, It's definitely a category. It's also a category of what I would consider the the more dangerous supplements. Not saying that they're dangerous, just saying if you had to rank – yeah. Supplements in terms of risk. Well, I I remember uh, you know back when these like hydroxycut and a lot of these brands kind of came out in in the sports world. Like uh, you know during the off season, a lot of athletes would mess with these things, and then we get into situations where there's heat exhaustion. You know we're getting back into camp and they're dehydrated, and meanwhile they're still taking these like hydroxycut and like fat burners and passing out, and a couple kids had died. That's, so that's uh, why a Fedra got pulled. Yeah, yeah. a Fedra yeah. got pulled because of a pitcher that was pitching like a like he was playing pitching like two games in 100, 100 degree weather had popped a bunch of the Xenadrin or Hydrox one of the companies that was selling ephedra and he died yeah yep, that yep. was originally how it got pulled off the shelf was they, they had enough situations they like have that. a high abuse potential because they're stimulants so like all stimulants you, you feel like you need more and more and more of them I'm not trying to scare anybody I mean to be quite honest uh, they're relatively safe compared to most things mm-hmm. uh, but they aren't they don't really help. And in fact, here's the thing. When I, here, I'll, I'll give you some examples of where they actually uh, are terrible. When I'm training a client who is a high stress, a good point. not getting good sleep, uh, you know, type A type individual, the very last thing I want to do is throw a very strong and CNS stimulant. It, it's, all, it's always yep. this client. That's drawn to these. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The client, the the cortisol junkie, the one that's already hopped up on three or four cups of coffee a day, that loves the pre workout, that loves the energy drinks, and then on top of that wants to take a fat burner. Like that and that's where this is this is where this gets out of hand. It's it's rarely the person that may benefit from a little bit of the stimulus every once in a while. It's normally the people that are drawn to that are the worst people that should at least in my experience. Like it's, when yeah. I when I had the clients that came to me that said, Hey, I've got this or hey, I want to talk about this, they're the same ones that I'm trying to lower stress, mm-hmm. get caffeine out of their diet, focus on their sleep. And that's the worst thing they could do. Yeah, and I've actually had I've actually had clients that uh, were stubbornly would take fat burners, and I'd noticed they would lose muscle as a result because stimulants cause stress hormones to rise. That's what that's why you're stimulated. It's part of the reason why you get stimulated. Mm-hmm. They actually started to lose muscle 
as a result. So, uh, you know, if you were to ask me how many times or how often I've ever recommended a fat burner, like to told a client you should probably take a fat burner, less than three in my entire career. I've almost never, 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 never recommended a fat burner. And again, the studies show long term, they do nothing for you, but make you feel super hopped up and stimulated, which is why they're such big sellers. They're not big sellers because they're effective. They're big sellers because... No. Because you feel like, and it's it's just promising a dream. So the other type of client I get with it is somebody who is overweight, and they thought that you know that was something to just throw into the mix on top of trying to you know fix their diet or everything else. Like that was going to be like a whole nother way to you know catalyze their progress going forward. Absolutely. Uh, next category didn't even exist when uh, we were all uh, in in the big box gyms working it, out. It also, well, it was for me because I was in there still when it first, I remember when I mean, it, it before, I mean, it, we, we were there when it first came out. Oh, yeah, yeah. It didn't exist I was there that. for five years plus before this hit the market, and I remember when it did, fell in love with it, used it like crazy, and then I remember it breaking my heart when I, years later I read the study on it that uh, explained that we first of all we don't even have the proof that an, ex, uh, an exogenous uh, uh, supplement like that can actually increase nitric oxide in your blood. So that kind of shit on my on my brain. And then two, it, that it has any direct connection with actually building muscle yeah. from that. Oil. So we're talking about nitric oxide boosters. Now I remember the very first ones that came out, and it was brilliant marketing again. Um, they, you know, these supplement markers understood that one of the most prized feelings that people get, and by the way, if you're a salesperson selling people with on their feelings is the most effective possible thing you could do. Mm -hmm. Supplement companies know this. When you lift weights, when you guys work out, what is your favorite the feeling? The pump, dude. The pump. Yeah. There's nothing it's better. It's like coming all the time. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what Arnold said in Pumping Iron, by the way, yeah. just in case, yeah. Yeah. just in case you thought Adam was being weird. Um, no, but, uh, uh the pump is something that everybody seeks and enjoys and loves. And so supplement companies were like, wait a minute. What if rather than selling a supplement that builds more muscle, burns more body fat, what if we create a supplement that promised to give people a better Let's pump? Let's tear everybody up. You know? And and, and the and the marketing was brilliant. They would show before and after on these on these commercials. And the before and after was not a 30-day before and after. They actually said to you, This is Tony before the workout. This is Tony right after his workout, and he's all pumped up. And it looks real dramatic because that's what it looks like when you get a pump. And it worked. People loved it. And these supplements contain amino acids and things that contribute to the production of nitric oxide or the compounds that help prevent the degradation of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, by the way, is uh, a compound that relaxes blood vessels and improves blood flow. So the theory is boost nitric oxide get more blood flow, get better pumps. We love pumps. Oh, pumps can make you build more muscle. By the way, the most effective nitric oxide boosting compound that there is are these uh, these uh, erectile dysfunction. Oh, I thought I was going to say blood doping. No, no, erectile dysfunction drugs like Viagra. Viagra. The way Viagra works is it it, 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 break, it slows down or, or stops the, the breakdown of nitric oxide, thus giving you the ability to get uh, an erection. Do these supplements improve performance strength and build muscle, uh, the vast majority of, of studies say no. Uh, no, they don't really help at all. They, they don't do much. There's some studies that show there may be some benefit at altitude. So if you're not accustomed to altitude and you take them, they can give you some benefit. Uh, uh, subjectively, do you get a better pump when you take nitric oxide boosters? I used to think so, and then I realized something. I used to drink drinks that were NO boosters right before my workout. Yeah, the sugar in there. And, well, well, what I realized and was no explode. What I realized is I was drinking 16 ounces of water yeah. before my workout. Yeah. Then I put that together and realized, wow, if I'm really hydrated. My favorite thing <laughs> to teach this lesson to someone who loves their NO explode is literally the, and I, I know I've given this tip on the show before, if uh, you don't remember, um, make an effort to literally drink a half gallon of water you know, relatively close to your workout. So sometime before your workout, if you work out at noontime, make it a goal to have at least a half gallon. I used to drink a half gallon through the workout and it would 
in na it would make my pump so nasty more than any supplement that I've ever taken before. So I think that more of what people are feeling from the pump is that they're drinking that extra 16 ounces of water, the shake and they're, they're in explode. Plus they're drinking their, they're probably thirsty too from yeah. that high sodium drink that makes mm -hmm. them want to drink more water. So they're pounding water on top of that. And that's where that pump feeling is probably coming from more now, than anything now else. Now studies will show that certain compounds like citrulline, which is, which is an amino acid that gets converted in the body to arginine and then it gets turned into nitric oxide does right raise nitric oxide a little bit in the in the system but that does not uh, correlate to better performance or more muscle hmm. so that's the thing it's like you don't want to just look at what's happening here you want to look downstream because ultimately the reason why you're taking a nitric oxide boosting supplement uh, is to try to build more muscle yeah. and in the grand scheme of things they can be fun you can enjoy taking them not a problem but are they going to move the needle for you Probably not. This fell in the category of I'm just taking this because I think it does something. Like, <laughs> yes. I literally had no idea what it did. Well, dude, pre, you know, nitric <laughs> well, the oxide the, boosting the, supplements didn't exist. Well, the, the theory the, that that I had or what I thought was true, and what I had when I used to sell it on sell to people and tell people was that more oxygen, more blood, right, more right. nutrients equals good bigger muscle. Yeah. I mean, that was it. It was if 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 I can give you a supplement that's going to promote more oxygen flow, which is going to promote more blood flow, which is that's how your tr your nutrients are transported to your muscles, then it must be building more muscle that way. Right. And, and that and, was the idea. And the and the truth Logical. is what does that is a good diet, good sleep and good hydration. Whether you or not you take a few key amino acids and compounds really isn't going to make uh, that big of a difference or any difference at all. It actually doesn't make that big of a difference at all in terms of any of that stuff. So nitric oxide boosters, again, is there some value? Maybe a tiny bit, but again, super overrated. They're way oversold. Uh, not a big deal. All right, the next category. Um, you know, this next category, there is some value to a small uh, subset of the population, but to everybody else is is a waste of money. These are testosterone boosting supplements. This is a touch. Uh, this yeah. is a touchy one, probably for somebody to hear. And I think it's important that you preface it with what you kind of mentioned right there. Is there is there is a group of people. Um, I would be an example of that. Uh, when I came off of testosterone, and I went and did my blood work, and then and did the Everywell test, and and w saw like my testosterone levels were in the floor, abnormally low. So. One of the things that I did during the recovery was I took a test booster. But what people don't understand is that if you already have normal testosterone levels for your body, normal levels, the testosterone booster doesn't put you above your your normal ranges. So it's it's a waste of money for somebody who is already normal. If you are somebody who is 50 years older or even if you're in your 30s or 40s and you've tested and you have extremely low testosterone, there's value to it for that person, but yes. what the but what most people do is exactly what I did when I was 17 years old. Yeah, they're old. already healthy. Yeah, I was I was 17 years old taking these things. Yeah, thinking that you know because you think it's testosterone like steroid, steroids. Yeah, you think it's going to be like over the counter steroids, and it's like no. And they're the most expensive, uh, typically in in the whole store. Yeah, and, and so it's like you know if I'm investing this, it must really work, and so that's that's the thought well, process. Well, here's it. the other thing though is that. Men will take a, a testosterone boosting supplement and they'll notice a boost in libido and they'll say it's working. Okay. Yes, there are herbs that boost libido. No, they don't raise testosterone. So, like uh, horny goat weed is an example of this. If your testosterone levels are normal, you're not going to get a rise in testosterone. You may notice a boost in libido, but it doesn't mean your testosterone levels went up. So, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're thinking, I'm going to raise my testosterone. To build more muscle. It ain't going to happen. Also, look at the percentages that the studies show that these things raise testosterone. You know, like 15%. Okay, so let's say your testosterone level's at 500. 15% boost is what? 575? You know? Yeah. It's, it's not nearly enough to cause any changes in muscle gain or strength. In fact, if you're somebody who takes anabolic steroids the minimum dose that you take to see gains would be thousands of times right. over something like well, that. Well, and a good example, too. I remember when you uh, did the Everly Well test on your testosterone, and I think you came around, I want to say, like 400 or 500 the first time, and that you were running the ketogenic diet. You changed, you introduced some carbs, switched some things up, 
And and I, bo- you, I boosted like crazy. Yeah, you shot like 400 points up. Yep. So that just shows you how when you talk about the things that are higher priorities as far as sleep, stress, diet, uh, and strength training as far as boosting your testosterone naturally, those things are are in a whole nother level in comparison. So if you're somebody who's dealing with all kinds of stress, your diet's all whack, and then you're turning around and you're spending $50 or more on a bottle of test boosters, what a waste of fucking money. Spend your time and effort getting better sleep or getting a better training program yep. or focusing on your diet a little bit or minimizing just overall stress in your life that you'll get so much more bang for your buck. And again, the reason why people buy testosterone boosters is because they feel the boost in libido. Um, But again, the boost in libido doesn't mean that your testosterone levels went up. Oftentimes it means testosterone stayed the same and it was something else. Here's the other thing. When you look at the studies on compounds that do raise testosterone in men with low testosterone, in that population, the effect is not permanent. So I'll give you a great example. Ashwagandha, Phenomenal adaptogenic uh, herb. It does raise testosterone in men with low testosterone. Not a crazy amount, but they do notice uh, a a, a measurable rise in testosterone. If that man stays on ashwagandha indefinitely, eventually it starts to lose its effect and the testosterone levels start to drop. You may also notice this with the libido effect. In fact, if you've tried a testosterone booster and it it boosted your libido. You probably noticed that after gave about you the boy-yo-yoing. Yeah, after about thirty to forty-five days or sixty days, it kind of stopped working. Like I don't have that that boost anymore. Um, but they promise a lot. You know, these testosterone boosters promise a lot. Like, not only are you going to raise your testosterone, but you're going to get the effects that anabolic steroids would provide. Nothing. <laughs> there's no raising, no natural raising of testosterone that will cause the effects of what anabolic steroids would cause. So right. again, super super overrated. All right, this next one, really popular, relatively recently. Oh, uh, yeah. Lots of promises. And gonna, it's, you're going to offend all the wellness people. I know I am. Yeah. And, and you know what's funny about this one is that this was actually considered a garbage junk product yeah. before they reversed it and flipped it and turned it yeah, into something now else. now it's like so hot. Yeah, we're talking about collagen protein. Now, collagen protein is protein that is that comes from so- collagen sources, uh, you know, tendon, yeah. ligament, ligaments, all that stuff, you know, bone, whatnot, nails. And they say supplement with this; it's going to make your skin better, it's going to make your hair better, your nails better, it's going to help your joints. Um, and then they have studies to support this. They'll show the studies and be like, "Hey, people who supplemented in this in this in this study with collagen noticed better skin, faster growing nails, better hair." But what they don't tell you is that in those studies, all those people con- had a very low protein diet so that they consume more collagen protein and then they got those effects. Guess what else happens when you take low protein people and put them on just more protein? <laughs> yeah. the same, the same thing. The same thing. Right. Uh, collagen protein back in the day was actually a, a, a garbage supplement. It was something that supplement manufacturers – they would put in their drinks and not tell you. Did we even get into this when we did the protein talk? We did. I think we did uh, talk a little bit. Did briefly. we talk about collagen? I yeah. couldn't remember yeah. if we did. I mean, I'm trying to right now. I'm trying to think how we listed uh, the the highest. Like you know, we did whey. We talked about concentrate, mm. isolate, and then egg protein. Egg you know, protein. Yeah. Where did we put collagen? We we, did, we really didn't talk about collagen. I didn't end. think we did. No, we mentioned it, but we didn't talk. We didn't list it as one of the top proteins because it isn't. No, yeah. it's actually amino acid profile. It's rating is one of the lower proteins. Um, if your protein intake is adequate, it's not going to do anything for you. So it's not a supplement that's going to add any extra benefit to a high-protein diet. If you want to, if you, let's say your protein intake is good, but it could be higher, will you get better benefits from supplementing with, let's say, a whey protein or egg protein over collagen? You will. Mm-hmm. Those, protein, uh, those protein sources have higher quality, better amino acid profiles um, for everything from performance uh, to muscle building. Now, is collagen protein bad? No, it's not going to hurt you. Um, it's here's what I like about collagen protein: it's flavorless. If you like to add protein to something and it doesn't taste, I like do anything, like it for that reason. Yeah. And it, there's a reason why it's five on our list and not one or two. It's, sure. I mean, it, of all the things that we listed, it's the least most overrated of mm-hmm. the five, right? But it still is. I mean, if uh, if you're going to be taking in adequate protein it's it is a waste of money you're completely fine there if you're on if you have low protein and you're going to choose to take it uh, you're even better off taking a different Re- type of recent protein. study just came out that showed that you need to eat far more collagen protein to equal the effects of lower amounts of better quality proteins in other words and i'm this is my i'm just throwing out numbers 
you would have to eat, let's say, two grams of collagen protein for every one gram of whey protein mm. because its amino acid profile wasn't great. And that's because all protein sources aren't equal. Some are better than others. And no joke, this is a 100% objective fact, collagen protein of all of the animal sources of protein is at the bottom. It's actually one of the worst sources of protein. Well, and you know, to your point that you made earlier that I think is so important to reiterate is that this was something that was thrown away for so many years. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like new science came out and we found out that it's like it's like oh, it was we, new marketing. Yes, mm -hmm. we found a way to market it to people, and that is why it's it's become popular again. Is because for someone who's a, who's selling it, you can buy it for relatively cheap in comparison to whey protein or whey isolate or your vegan protein. You can get it for like cents on the dollar in comparison. So if I can just convince people that it's of great value like the other types of proteins, then I can make a shit ton. Of, there's better margins. It's got it's, – it's got, okay, so do you know what has collagen protein? Jello. You know that that's oh, that's yeah. why Jello's got that's why it becomes firm or whatever. It's actually collagen protein. Collagen protein is relatively flavorless. So when they said, "Hey, you can add this to your coffee," it's a great protein for that because you can throw it in there. It doesn't taste like anything but the coffee and mm -hmm. whatever you put in there, butter or, or MCT oil or whatever they do. You sneak it in there. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't have flavor. Again, it's low quality, and it's the marketing. The word collagen, right? We know collagen is in skin. And you want your skin to look good. We put it in your lips. We know it's in your your. <laughs> we know your hair. Oh, and collagen in your joints. And so people make that one that that comparison. And so it was an easy thing to sell, but it's largely uh, a waste of money. And if you're going to increase your protein intake with a protein, some kind of a protein supplement, your best options don't include collagen. You're you're looking at either whey protein, egg protein is really good. Um, and you know your your mixed vegan sources are even really good. Collagen by itself, uh, totally totally overrated, overpriced, uh, and I would say almost a complete waste of money. Yeah. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. They're all totally free. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.